Hello, welcome to today's devotion. We're going into the new year, uh, second set of devotions. We are still in the Gospel of Luke, and today we are looking at the ninth chapter, verse 28. Ninth chapter, verse 28. The heading to what we're about to read is the transfiguration. They use that as a heading because it is the account where um, when Jesus is up on top of the mountain, um, he is transfigured before them. So let's pray and uh, we'll get into it. Thank you, Father, for your word. And as we once again read your word, we pray that you open up our hearts and minds to understand and to hear what it says, what you are saying more precisely as you speak to us through your spirit. Please give us quiet hearts that are open to hearing your voice as you teach us and lead us and guide us in your truth. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 28 of chapter 9 of Luke writes as follows, about eight days after this conversation, conversation that they're talking about was picking up one's cross and uh, following him, and that came on the tail of a revelation that was given to Peter regarding who Jesus was and is, the Messiah. So, as we continue with verse 8, eight days after this conversation, Jesus took along Peter, who had just been given the revelation regarding Jesus' Messiahship, John and James, who were Jesus, are, are Peter's um, business partners. They were both fishermen. And went up on the mountain to pray. Now, we don't know what mountain it is. Different scholars have different ideas. Bottom line is they went up on a mountain to pray. I tend to believe that it's Herman, but that's just my take on it. As Jesus was praying, the appearance of his face changed. And his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. Peter and those with him were in a deep sleep. And when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who were standing with him. As the two men were departing from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let us set up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he was saying. Now, this is important to understand. Um, on, a, on a much bigger level than just the individual account. In Genesis, when the world was created, it was created as part of and, and, and one with the spiritual world. They were not separated as they are now. The spiritual, or sometimes they're called the divine sons of God, the spiritual family, the sons of God that you read about in Job, and the human sons of God that were to reign with God here on earth. They saw each other. They were one. It's where God dwelt. The Garden of Eden was not just where Adam and Eve existed and lived. It was also the abode of God. It's where God's fullness, in terms of his, his reigning um, families, if you will, lived. Later, after Genesis 3, there was separation between the two. The spiritual world was no longer able to be accessed by Adam and Eve, the human family. They could still speak with God, and they did. They still knew God, for the, at one time they were with him. But with regards to access to the spiritual realm and God's throne, if you will, God's presence, no. And ever since then, there's this there's this this chasm between the two Jesus in coming to this world brings the two back together his message is that the kingdom of God where God 
reigns, if you will, but more importantly, where God has say, has come to earth. Repent and trust. And his teaching and the discipleship to his teaching and to, even more importantly, him gives us the right to not only be called children of God, but to grow in an increasing awareness of his presence around us. In other words, the two become one. As Paul says in his letter to the Ephesian church, Jesus came to bring heaven and earth together again. So when Jesus goes up on the mountain of transfiguration, he is able to go into the heavenly realm and speak with his father, see the heavenly realm and see what his father is doing and be one with that realm while living in this world. No one else can because of this condition called sin, rebellion, which keeps us from being able to live in that place with God so intimately. So Jesus repeatedly in his teaching says, I can do nothing by myself. I can only do what I see my father doing. For whatever the father does, for the father loves the son and shows him all he does. So Jesus can see. He even says later in the Gospel of John, I am telling you what I have seen in the, pro- in the father's presence. You do what you have heard from your father. So Jesus is able to see into that realm. He can also hear God's voice. He says before raising Lazarus, Father, I thank you that you hear me. I knew that you always heard me. Or he says, Father, I thank you that you heard me. I knew that you always hear me. I said this for the benefit of those standing here that they may believe that you sent me. So Jesus is in in himself bringing heaven and earth back together. What needed to be defeated ultimately to bring the two realms together. Right now it's together in him. But to bring the two realms together was the death and resurrection. Which is why when we see after the resurrection, Jesus' ministry, he's able just to do things that like are of a a Marvel character. Pops in here, pops in there. But that's because his body now, while it was an earthly body, has become a divine or a, a glorified body is what the scripture would call it what Paul would call it in 1 Corinthians 15. But in this case, he is transformed because he is able to go into that realm and interact with that realm and as such takes on the appearance of what, what's called glory. Glory, if, if you will, is everything good. We refer to it spiritually, especially in the Gospel of John, as light. Everything good. And so he is, once again, by going up to the mountain. Now remember, also, mountain is a very important place because it's where God dwells. Now, you see God dwell with humanity and with his creation in Genesis 1 and 2 in the garden. The next time that we see God dwelling, if you will, with his people is at Mount Sinai. So now his dwelling is a mountain. And this is common um, thinking among even pagans that the gods would live in the mountains where human beings don't live or God would, gods would live where it's very lush, where there's no scarcity of water, where, where there's no scarcity of food, etc. This is where God dwells. And in this case, what he's doing is he is bringing Jesus into his, where he abodes, where he dwells, if you will, and is able to see the glory. If Take a look at it again. As he was praying, let's go up again, about eight days after this conversation, Jesus took Peter, John, and James and went up on the mountain to what? To pray. Prayer is the arrangement that God has made For he and us to do things together. It is the most intimate of all conversations. And Jesus prays constantly. You would think he wouldn't have to um, with regards to him being able to see the Father and hear the Father. But just because his awareness 
is a fully uh, or a fully developed, not fully developed, fully realized awareness of God doesn't mean that he doesn't talk to God and pray and work things out because this is what it means to be human. Jesus will soon go to the garden and work this out with God. What is he working out? He knows God's plan. When we work things out with God, what are we working out? We don't know God's plan. So we're seeking his kingdom. We're seeking his will. We're seeking his presence. In this case, Jesus, when starting here and then all the way through through his crucifixion, is praying to God and drawing into God for strength and for the ability to go through what God has called him to go through because he realizes he will never be able to do it on his own in the same way that we cannot do life on our own. So he goes to this mountain to pray, specifically to pray. This is where God had directed him. This is where God will meet with him, if you will, in this manner. And as he's praying in verse 29, then the appearance of his face changed. I can tell you firsthand that prayer will change your countenance. In this case, it not only changes his countenance, it changes his appearance. Take a look at it once again. Verse 29, as he was praying, the appearance of his face changed. His deep connection with God was such that you could, it could be seen by others. This is not a physical thing. This is a spiritual appearance. That's why when we take a look at and think of angels and such, we, we think of them as these glowing beings. And they are because they're from a much glorified realm. But here we see that the two realms are coming together. And... His clothes became dazzling white. Their appearance changed. Suddenly, two men were talking with them, Moses and Elijah. Now, this is, these are the two men. This is important, um, an important account of the, the ministry and the mission and God's plan of salvation. The one thing about Moses and Elijah and Jesus is that they were all part of of the oneness of God's plan or the oneness of God's ways. God makes things very clear with regards to who he is, how he thinks, and what he has in in mind. And that it's different than what you and I have in mind. So the scriptures will say, Um, speaking on behalf of the Lord, my ways, says God, are not your ways. And my thoughts are not your thoughts. This is very, it, it is so profound because we tend to think that we know God's thoughts. Even, even if you don't script, pick up the scriptures, we tend to think that we know what God's thoughts are and that we know of, of the best way, if you will. So when bad things can happen to us, even those that don't believe in God or maybe believe in God partially say, God, why are you doing this to me? If you're so good, why are you allowing this to happen? It doesn't make sense. In other words, you're taking on the role of God and saying, I know better than you. This is a common human condition to think that we know better than God, which is why when we go through things, that condition comes to the surface and we get very frustrated. Why is this happening? I know better than God. This shouldn't be happening to me. Why is it happening to me? Why doesn't it happen to everybody? God is not fair. These are thoughts that come natural to us because of this this rebellious belief that we know better than God. If you take a look at the cross, that nature, if if, if we were given that same task, that nature would come (laughs) front and center. Why do I need to go to the cross? They should be the ones that have to go to the cross. I mean, this is what we would think. This is how we would feel. But this is not how Jesus thought, nor did he feel, because he was seeking God and learning of his ways and, more importantly, trusting in his ways. 
And in, in so doing, becoming, as the scripture would say, perfect. As the scripture would say, he was made perfect through suffering. It was pleasing to God that the author of their faith should be made perfect through suffering. So this is very profound, what's gonna, what is taking place here. We're going to revisit it next time we uh, pick up because there's so much to this account. It's not just a, 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 a nice little a respite, if you will, or encouragement before he goes to the cross. This is a key uh, turning uh, of direction with regards to his, setting his, his sight towards Jerusalem. Well, thank you so much for tuning in next time. I uh, hope in the meantime that God's blessing be with you and his peace as well. I'll see you.